All right. You can see that okay? Okay. And is my audio all right? Great. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about a package that we, or I came out with, I don't know, maybe like six months or so ago called Workflow Sets. Um, as you'll see in a little bit, it's basically if you want to create um, simultaneously create like a lot of models and maybe when that's a good idea, maybe when that's not a good idea. Um, so if, if you don't know me, I'm Max Kuhn. I'm currently in Connecticut uh, where I live. I work for our studio. I'm a software engineer, mostly working on modeling. And if you were to ask Hadley, what type of modeling? He would just say, well, everything. So uh, I've got a group of uh, myself and three other people, Davis, Vaughn, uh, you know, Hannah Frick and Julia Silge. Uh, and we basically just try to make, you know, the phrase I use that is not a our studio catchphrase, but it's like, let's, you know, make, modeling suck less than R. Um, that's actually quite good, so I shouldn't really say that, but you know, we're just trying to make it easier to do things. Um, so we work on what we call the tidy models infrastructure. Um, it's very much modeling with all the tidy burst principles um, that you probably have heard of. Um, and then we also layer in a lot of things that we think are very um, specific to modeling. Uh, and, you know, a lot of those things are, you know, modeling, I think average modeling software is, tends to be a lot more complex than your average visualization or data manipulation software. And it's really easy to get some of those things wrong without even knowing it. Um, and so one of our goals is just to make things work pretty well and kind of maybe sometimes silently protect the users from making uh, a bad decision or, or trying a methodology that's not uh, unwittingly try a methodology that's not maybe a good idea. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, um, tidymodels.org is the first place I'd send you to. Um, we spent a lot of a lot of time at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we had a lot of documentation, but it was in a lot of different places. And so we we decided to really edit that, merge some things, and come up with you know some documentation that's a good narrative. So if you want to know more about the packages, you can come here. If you've never used tidy models, we'll see some of it tonight. But if you want to learn more, I'd, I'd suggest coming to the get started page. And there's sort of like a flow here um, for the basic tools that we have um, for modeling. So this is a, a really good resource. And also one nice thing about it is it has, we continually update uh, a list of all the functions and things in tidy models. So, you know, if you were like, oh, where's that Bayesian thing that Max was talking about? You can come in here and search across all of our packages uh, and functions and data sets and find whatever you're looking for. Because there's quite a bit inside of Tidy Models. Uh, another resource that Julie and I have been working on is a book called Tidy Modeling with R. We'll make a print copy of it, maybe start talking to publishers in a few months. It's nearly done. Um, we have all but, um, we have drafts of all these chapters and PRs. But if you're more into like long form documentation and want to know, in some cases, why we do what we do and why we do it the way we do it, um, this is a, a really good resource. So uh, these would be the two places. If you're if you're interested in the book, especially, maybe try out the um, R for Data Science Slack. Um, they've been running a bunch of cohorts uh, in a book club for this. So if you want to learn with other people, they've got a, a bunch of people who are doing um, presentations on different chapters. So that's a good place to start. And uh, if you want the slides, including the RMD file and everything, my GitHub handle is Topepo, and you'll see the 2021 uh, R ladies. So that's all in here. So if you like, especially the formatting of the slides, it's Sharingan, uh, Allison Hill, uh, tried to reverse engineer some of our existing um, talk formats. So if you if you like this, you can use it and uh, credit Allison. All right, so about what we want to talk about, um, I want to just talk about um, some not like philosophical aspects of modeling, but I do want to talk about the idea of some of the things that, that we're going to go through because it really sheds light on why we or why we do the things that we do. So right now, when you build something in tidy models, there's really like what we consider like this modeling process. Like you could think of it like a scikit-learn pipe, uh, pipeline if you've ever heard of that. Um, but really we currently consider that each model involves something that we call preprocessor and then like an actual statistical model or machine learning model. And so a processor might be something simple like a formula that we're used to in R 
or um, we have this package called recipes, which is a very sort of souped up cross between like dplyr and, and model net matrix. Um, and you can do very sophisticated things with it. So any preprocessor is the thing that um, takes your data and does any feature engineering or any estimation, or any feature extraction, or even transformations or interactions. Um, those things that you do to the data before putting it in the model is what we consider happens with the preprocessor. And then the model is the model, right? So whether it's like a linear regression or a random force model, um, you take what the preprocessor generates and then you put that into the, the model matrix and go anyway. Um, now there's other things that we haven't implemented yet. The most important one in this modeling process would be like post-model activities. So you can imagine the idea that, um, let's say I have a two class classification problem and maybe you have imbalanced samples or, or, or something like that. And you don't wanna necessarily use the default 50% cut point to take a probability and convert it to a hard class prediction. You might wanna optimize that cut point based on like sensitivity and specificity and things like that. So there are a lot of things like calibration, cutoff optimization that we consider to be part of the modeling process. And we are gonna tack those on to our, our system and infrastructure. It's just uh, Davis is in the process of implementing that now. So in general though, I wanna get across that this modeling process is not just, just the model like, you know, your estimation of like your slopes and intercepts or whatever. It's really a broader aspect of like a pre-processor a model and eventually will uh, incorporate post-processing um, bits that you would do after the models fit. So in terms of tiny models, we consider the building blocks of this process to be, you know, these pre-processors and models. And in tiny models, we have a package called Parsnip, which is sort of like the unified modeling interface that we provide. And then I mentioned, you know, formulas could be a preprocessor, or if you've ever used recipes or heard of that, that would be the way we typically um, do our preprocessing. Um, unless you have something really simple where your, your data is already fit for modeling um, when you get it. So these are the, the basic components. And what I want to what I want to emphasize here is when we think about modeling in terms of like estimating things like whether it's slopes and intercepts, we tend to only think about that for this part with a model. But in actuality, you know, we are doing estimation bits uh, with data in the preprocessors. So let me like show you a, an example of that. Something really simple would be like you have a bunch of like highly correlated predictors. And we know that's problematic for a lot of models like, like linear regression, like multicollinearity um, can really negatively affect your model. And you might want to do something about that. And the the you know the most common thing, at least from when I was in graduate school, was to do um, principal component regression, which is basically you compute the principal components on your data and you use those components as the actual predictors instead of the original raw data. So you know the old school way to talk about it is PCR principal component re regression, but you know the the cool kids are saying feature extraction. Now, but in, in essence, you're, you're taking your original data and extracting out basically the really important um, underlying content that's in the data and characterized by the, the principal components. And so do we consider that part of the estimation? Like, do we consider that part of the model? And that's a, an important question. It might seem like a philosophical question, but it's not. It has some like really practical ramifications. And so, you know, you can imagine taking your data and let's say just a simple formula and then doing, you know, PCA and then taking the output of that and putting it into, let's say, your linear model. And then that produces your fitted model with slopes and intercepts for your predictors and so on. And so the idea is like, well, is this the modeling process? Like is estimation just right here? And you can probably guess my answer is going to be like, no, oh, not so much. This is really the estimation process that those slopes or the, the PCA loadings that you use to calculate the scores are estimated, right? And they have variation associated with them. And so when we think about what we're estimating in terms of like the, you know, the quote unquote model, it involves both the, the, the literal model, say in, in terms of least squares and also any potential pre-processing that you're doing beforehand. Now, you might not think that's a big deal. You might be like, all right, well, that's, Seems like you're splitting hairs there. One of the problems that we see, like I see it a lot on Stack Overflow and in other places is that it can often lead to poor estimates of performance. 
So if you don't, um, well, there's a typo. Um, if you don't uh, treat the PCA parts as estimation, you assume that they're known like deterministic values and then you don't get to factor in the, um, the impact of, the, of that estimation process. So sometimes like PCA is fairly innocuous, but if you're using, let's say, a, a complex imputation method or splines or something like that, um, something that has the ability to be a little more of a low bias model, um, this can lead to you uh, overfitting to the training set and not getting, not knowing that you're getting going to get bad performance on new data. Um, another really good example is uh, selection bias and feature selection. So a long time ago, some people who were doing research on support vector machines like they kind of reinvented like backward selection. They called it recursive feature engineering. And they showed for some like early microarray data sets that were very like, um, you know, dozens of data points, but thousands of predictors. They showed that, you know, they could do like backward selection and get down to zero errors. Um, but they didn't do their cross validation right. They didn't treat feature selection as, you know, part of the estimation process. They wouldn't have put it in this box here. And in doing so, led them to think that they could get nearly perfect performance. And then some statisticians came along and what they did is they took the same data and the same software and they just scrambled the outcomes over and over again and showed that if you just had nonsense data in the, your outcome, you could still get down to zero errors, um, you know, incorrectly. And that was simply because they treated feature selection not as part of the modeling process. Um, and then there's things like information leakage where you, accidentally or sometimes people purposefully include data that's uh, data components of the, the parts that they're predicting in the original uh, training process. And, and so you wouldn't be able to do that by including everything in the estimation uh, box. So anyway, these problems are really become more and more um, uh, pronounced as your preprocessor becomes more complex. So, you know, the more powerful your preprocessor is, the more likely you're going to have um, these types of problems. So what we did was, you know, it's really easy in, in R to, you know, do your preprocessing and then just put it in the model. And then let's say like resample the model or something like that. And so what we, we thought about doing was combining, well, there were two reasons. Uh, combine the model in your preprocessor into what we call a workflow. And again, you can think of this, we were just going to call it a pipeline because that's what everybody else seems to call this. But then we realized we already had like dplyr pipelines and that was going to be confusing. So we call it the model workflow. And that's where you bind together a preprocessor and a model object. And one nice thing about it, one practical nice thing about it is that, you know, if you're if you're trying a variety of models, and then like you fit some models and figure out, oh, right, you know, these, this portion of the data is not, you know, doing very well. The model's not modeling it very well. You might go back and um, add some more model terms, like do some more pre-processing that will improve your model. And so you might have a series of models and then a series of pre-processors. And then sometimes if you have, you know, different combinations of those, it's hard to keep your work organized because, you don't know that this model fit was coupled with this preprocessor object and so on. And so one nice practical thing you can do with a model workflow, as you'll see in a little bit, is you can, you can sort of bind them together and it helps you organize your work. Um, and then another thing is, is if you combine them together, you know, what we'll do is we'll just give you like one fit and predict interface. And it not only makes your code simpler, but in, we make sure that the estimation problems are all treated like uh, the overall modeling um, pipeline or workflow. So in other words, you can't just estimate the model and say, oh, that's the part I did. Like in the example we had earlier, it would include the PCA um, calculations. So here's what it would look like in tiny models. Um, you can load the tiny models meta package and it'll load like recipes and parsnip and workflows and things like that. Um, I'll use the Chicago data. This data is, um, I've used it quite a bit where we have ridership numbers every day uh, for a particular um, Chicago station uh, for the L trains. And then what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict ridership based on the other predictors. Most of those other predictors are lagged ridership at that station and other stations, but there's also data information and, and other things that we can use. And so if I want to do my initial training and test set split, there's a function called initial split that will do that. 
Um, and then you can extract out the training set and the test set based on how you want to do that initial split. Uh, what Parsnet does is it creates sort of a unified method for fitting models. And so if you're just going to fit a regular old ordinary least squares model, you would just use the linear reg function and then tell it to fit that with LM. Different engines would be things like Stan or TensorFlow or Glimnet. So, you know, you can choose the model type and then set the engine and that declares like, well, which package or which function are we going to use to estimate that? Um, and then this is a good example of a preprocessor. So what we're going to do is use a recipe. You start off the recipe by saying, you know, what's the outcome and what are the predictors and everything besides ridership in this data frame is a predictor. Um, and but one thing that's in there is the date, which is in a date format, but we can't just dump that date format into LM or we could, but it'll get treated like an integer. And so what recipes does is you can pipe in different like pre-processing steps. In this case, we use step date on that particular column in the data set. And that'll let us convert that date to a factor for the day of the week, you know, a month factor, and then the year and other things that you might want to include. So this replaces a bunch of Lubridate code you might have had um, to do this. Um, for this particular data set, what's another really important component is, as you might expect, ridership is really, really low on holidays. So we also have a function called step holiday that when you give the date, um, you can tell it which holidays uh, that you would like it to create indicator variables for. Um, and then the next thing we do in this recipe is we update the role of date. So we've used date so far to define new features that are going to our model, but date itself is not really a feature anymore that we would put in the model. So we could either delete it using it within the recipe or better yet is we can change its, ro its role, which used to be predictor, but now we can change it to really anything, but I just use it as an ID variable. And by setting its role to be ID, when we use this recipe in a model, it will not consider date to be a predictor for the model. It will just be like an identifier. It'll come along for the ride and all the pre-processing and all the things we do. But when we actually go to fit the model, this ensures that this is not in the X matrix. So we have generated factors for day of the week and month. And so we, we don't automatically convert those to dummy variables and recipes. So the next thing you can do is do that via this step called step dummy. Um, now you might notice I use date in all these steps. You can do any like type of dplyr selector that you want here. So you could have a like, comma, you know, minus something and so on. Um, recipes has some additional selectors in it that are based on the roles or the data type. So if I do step dummy on all nominal predictors, that means uh, convert any predictors that are factor or character to dummy variables. And then it saves, of course, those levels and, and ensures that new data gets converted in the same way. Um, and then we're going to fit, uh, um, we're going to do PCA on our, our data. And so before we, we do PCA, we want to center and scale the data. And so what I'm going to do is also include all numeric predictors now and make sure that they get centered and scaled so they're in the same units so that we can then put them in PCA. And so in, in PCA here, we have a vector called stations, which has all the column names for the, the stations that are predictors in the model. And this, of course, is a dplyr selector that will select those. Those will be used for PCA, and then we'll choose 10 components. Um, there's about, I think, 21 stations here, and you know, 10 captures a good amount of the variation. And so this is a fairly complicated preprocessor. It does a lot of things that model.matrix can't do. Um, it, it really is more complicated, but at the same time, it allows you to do things um, that you couldn't do. And you might have had like a bunch of side code over and over again that you've copied and pasted a bunch, you know, from script to script. And one nice thing about recipes, it sort of encapsulates all the data pre-processing things you want to do, whether they're just like simple things like generating holidays from dates or more complex things like PCA. Um, and this is what you can do with a recipe. Now, again, there's estimation bits in here. There's the PCA loadings, the means and variances for um, normalization. I kind of consider dummy variables to be an estimation 
feature to or an estimation process too, because you're looking at the data and pulling out, extracting information to apply to new data, which in this case is the factor levels. And so what we'll do is we'll bind this together within a workflow. So we're gonna combine our model for linear regression along with our recipe that does the pre-processing and PCA. And to do that, we start a new workflow and then we can pipe in code that adds the model to it and adds the recipe. Um, and that is kind of a long winded way of showing you what a workflow is within R. Now I should, one other aspect of this is that the regression model specification here and the recipe, you know, don't actually do anything yet. They're like specifications. It's kind of like, you can imagine like you create a ggplot, like with your ggplot code. And, you know, if you were to just save that plot as an object, it actually doesn't really execute much of anything. It's not like it's drawn all the circles and, and rectangles and it's just waiting to show them to you. It's not until you like print it or, you know, just hit enter after you define the ggplot that things actually happen. And so ggplot and dplyr and a lot of our tools follow this sort of like delayed execution uh, uh, format. And that's the same thing we do in tidy models is this code here doesn't fit the model. In fact, there's no formula, there's no data equals anywhere here. So these are more like specifications of the things that you want to do. And then you can bind them together with a recipe. And then we'll show you actually how to fit that model. Okay. So if you have questions, go ahead and feel free to put them in the chat. So what are good and bad ways of fitting this particular model? Well, we do have um, an API with recipes. If you use them by themselves, there's a way to estimate the parameters in a recipe. That's what this prep does. And then apply them to new data. That's what this uh, bake method does. So it's kind of like we use this analogy about making food. Like you define what your recipe is, you prepare it by getting everything ready. And then when you want to make the recipe, for example, you would bake it. And so what this does is, um, and this is, a, I, I didn't make this up. This is out of a Stack Overflow question where somebody took the entire data, data set, not just the training set. They generated the PCA scores for the entire data set. And then, you know, then they do the training and test set split. And then they, they fit the model um, and then make predictions. And that's not a very great way of doing it because, for example, if you were to resample this, you wouldn't end up resampling any of the BCA parts. Um, so your performance estimates would not necessarily be very good. Um, a much better way to do it is to take the workflow, which again includes the preprocessor and the model, fit it to the data set. And what this does is it goes through, does the dummy variables, it does normalization, it does the PCA parts, and then it hands that data over to the LM model that we defined. And it does all that stuff in just one single call. And then similarly, when you go to make predictions for that model, what it does is it takes the new data, it applies the same pre-processing step. So it applies the same dummy variable encodings. It takes the means and variances from the training set and normalizes a test set with those. And then again, it projects the data into PCA space using the loadings that were defined on the training set. So you know, when we predict things, we don't really ever re-estimate anything. Um, and that's really the proper way to do like any sort of pre-processing or estimation parts. So this interface is not only simpler, it's more appropriate from a methodology standpoint. And so that's the nice thing about, one of the nice things about using workflows is there's a lot of like, you can see there's a fair amount of like loading up here with specifications and details. Um, so this is a little bit more verbose than just fitting LM, but you'd have to have all these other parts in a script somewhere to do all of these bits. So I think in the end, this code is more concise and self-contained. It just looks like it's more than you would normally do because you're probably not used to doing it. Um, so you pay a little bit of complexity up front here and the benefit is a really simple API when you go to either um, estimate things or make predictions on that, that model workflow. So the thing is like, okay, here's a question. Uh, how important is the order of piping together components in the workflow? Uh, do you mean this part? Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Um, like if you did add recipe, then add model, it, it's just putting them in like slots inside the workflow. 
Um, the these do matter. Like the recipe steps matter. Like if you did step date at the end, um, you know, you would you wouldn't be like applying any of the other things below this step to it. Like so, the order matters here. It doesn't really matter here. So yeah. Okay. So a lot of times when we have data sets, you know, it's not like we learned or I learned in like graduate school or reading books. Like, you know, in, in books, a lot of times they give you a data set and they say, oh, you know, there's multicollinearity, let's like fix that. And they show you like one question or like one um, approach to doing it. And you feel like, oh, okay, well that was problem solved. And that's not really how things work that you might try one thing and then maybe it doesn't work or maybe you wanna try something else to see if it works better. So this idea of like, when you have like a real data set that you're working on, especially if it's a data set you've never seen before, um, you know, we tend to, it's more like a campaign. It's more like we try this one thing, it seemed to go okay, but maybe we tried this other thing, like it worked a little bit better, but maybe I should use random forest. So maybe I should do that. And you end up having like this sort of like, um, uh, you sort of end up having this sort of like trail of like models that you've used and some of them you liked and some of them you didn't. And you borrow like ideas from this one to try it in a neural network or something like that. And so what I'll talk about in a second is like, how would we do that? Especially up front, how would we do that um, using workflows? So what we don't want you to have to do is to type out, let's say we're, in the end, we're gonna try 10 different combinations of like preprocessor models. We don't want you to do like all this typing like 10 times. So the point of the majority of this talk is about how we can um, make that processing easier. Uh, questions, what's the structure of PC recipe looks look like? Um, well, I guess I'd refer to the recipe docs. When you print it out, it has a really nice print method, but under the hood, it saves a lot of different things. It saves like the steps that you've executed um, along the way, it saves their value. So it's not a simple structure. Um, it's more of like a list with a bunch of classes added to it. So um, we do have tidy methods for everything. So for example, if you wanna extract out what the means and standard deviations were, like you can get the loadings and the, the means and standard deviations and whatnot from any of these steps um, through tidy methods. But the, the actual recipe structures is fairly complicated. But I mean, we've documented it pretty well. Um, so yeah. All right. So, um, you know, a lot of times we're gonna fit many workflows. Um, in, in the book that we wrote on feature engineering, we use this data set a lot. And, you know, when you have some time, like maybe test this out because we go through our thought process that we use when we first started to model this data. Like, you know, we first were doing pretty good and then we were like, oh, what, what residuals are really bad? And then we figure out, oh, right, those are mostly holidays. So we should add holidays as predictors. And so we just sort of sequentially go through different things we tried and, and different things that seem like good ideas, but maybe didn't pan out so well. Um, so let's think of this, like we know we have this collinearity problem. You know, we can try PCA. We might wanna try partial least squares and partial least squares is like PCA, but it takes account the outcome in, into the, the loadings. So whereas PCA only uses the X data to generate the loadings, PLS uses the Xs and your Y data to come up with its components. So we might try another extraction method. We might actually, instead of doing PCA, we might just do a correlation filter. We might say, you know, give me all the, you know, give me all the stations so that their, um, you know, their, at, or their maximum correlation is always less than 0.7 or something like that. Like some sort of filter where we're eliminating predictors from the model. Or we might just say like, you know, I'll let the model figure it out. We might use Glimnet or some other regularized model that is built to handle collinearity. So these are just like a three different, three or four different ways that we might approach this problem, which is a linear model um, of dealing with these correlated predictors. So like, how would we do that? Now, before I say that, uh, there's quite a lot of discussion on uh, the Not So Standard Deviations podcast about this um, in terms of like workflow sets. And, and the thing that I thought about, um, you know, I wanna say like, you know, when would you use this? It's really good when you're starting from scratch and you really don't have any idea like what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Um, it might be good for variable selection. If we have time, I have an example at the end. 
Um, but it's, it's really good for situations where you want to try a variety of different methods. Now, I should say before I was at our studio, I worked in drug discovery and we, I built a lot of computational chemistry models and we would get updated versions of the data all the time. And so I probably wouldn't use workflow sets as I'll show you in a minute to do that type of work because you know I'd already done that work up front. And then when I got new data, I would just update the model, make sure the drift from the original data set wasn't too bad and then um, go on my way. So like, if you know what you should be doing and you have a lot of experience with the data set, what I'm gonna show you in a little bit is like really overkill. I mean, you could still do it, but it might not be the best use of your time. So it's really when you have like a novel problem, you're not really sure what to do um, that you would use these methods. Um, again, like if you have a well-defined problem, it's, it's kind of overkill. Um, and I, I thought about making this package like for about a year and I think, oh, I should do this. And I thought, well, this could be like really poorly used. Like this could lead to a lot of overfitting. I know AutoML is a big deal. And in a way I'm kind of like pro AutoML, but at the same time, one thing that sort of terrifies me is the idea that people are just gonna like throw the kitchen sink at it, maybe not with a great methodology and then just automatically pick what's best and not think about what they're doing. So, so I decided in the end to, to make this R package because I thought there are some legit cases like that people are going to use it. And I thought, well, geez, if I had something like this when I was doing data analysis, I would have loved it. But just, you know, putting caveats on there's, you know, you end up opt sometimes over optimizing a particular metric and, and get unintended consequences of your models. And it's possible that workflow sets could enable that, but it, it's also likely that it's going to legit solve some good problems. So just be aware that it's maybe not what you, I don't think this is the first tool you should reach for necessarily. All right, so, you know, I talked about a workflow, maybe perhaps unsurprisingly, a workflow set is a bunch of workflows sort of kept together in a group. Um, and then the, the value of doing that is it makes it easy to make a lot of workflows. Like this workflow set tool will help you make combinations of, you know, preprocessors and models you can estimate them and evaluate them and even rank them using relatively simple code. And so let's do this. Let's define a couple recipes and then two models and then let's fit the combinations of those for the Chicago data. So you've already seen the linear regression model here. This is just ordinary least squares. Um, I'll take a neural net model. Um, it has some tuning parameters. So in, um, in Tiny models, what we do is we put these little tags or placeholders for the things that we want to tune. Um, so we don't know how many hidden units we should use, so we're going to want to optimize that. Like in comparison to LM, there's really just slopes and intercepts to estimate. There's no structural parameters to worry about, whereas the amount of weight decay or the, the architecture of the uh, net is, you know, does need to be optimized. So these are going to be our two models. And then what we'll do is we'll find, to find a base recipe here that is like everything up to the normalization part. And then uh, what we can do is from, from this base recipe, pipe in a couple of different ways we would deal with the collinearity. So first one is like PCA, where we say, you know, let's do the same thing we were talking about before. You'll notice here that we're gonna optimize a number of components. We're not sure if it should be one or 10 or 15. Um, we'll do another recipe that uses partial least squares. So this looks very similar. You have to tell it what the outcome is. So it can do the estimation, the supervised estimation of the components. And again, we don't know how many components, so we'll optimize that. And then another thing we can do is we can do this correlation filter. And for some threshold, let's say the threshold is 0.8, it gets rid of the minimum set of predictors so that the um, absolute correlation like pairwise correlations are all below 0.8. Um, you know, we don't know what that threshold should be here. And actually this data is so correlated, the, the minimum um, uh, pairwise correlation is about 0.8. So we probably wanna optimize this to be like thresholds between like 0.8 and one and see if um, you know, simple filtering will solve our problem better than PCA or PLS. So we have two models, uh, we have three different uh, preprocessors defined by these recipes. And, you know, it makes sense to maybe try all, all six of these to see what works and what doesn't. Okay. Find ways to automatically keep track of the means and variances. 
Uh, speak, yeah. Okay, Mara, I'm glad this helps. Um, what I would do is if you if you do this, um, you definitely probably want to look at the tidy method for step normalize. It'll it'll give you like a data frame if you if you have to show people like well here are the means and standard deviations. Um, the tidy method would be good for that. Uh, you don't need to extract those to use in your computations. Like recipes does all that for you. So the tidy method is just a lot of times when you want to know like like you know let's let's say you find like PCA component four was really important to the model. Like you can use a tidy method on that to to figure out the loadings like which of the individual predictors are really important to component four and so on. So it's mostly for like post hoc analysis and uh, exploration of what happened inside of your model. But I hope it helps. Okay. So again, we have two objects here, three preprocessor objects here. And then when we create a workflow set, we load the workflow set package that automatically gets loaded with the tiny models package. And then basically you give it a list. So um, what we're going to do is actually we'll use four. We're going to do the, like, don't do anything, right? Just a simple recipe where it goes up to normalization. We give it the PCA recipe, the PLS and the filtering recipe. And then we give it a, a named list of our models. And lo and behold, perhaps unsurprisingly, we get a tibble back. And so we, we basically come up with little uh, unique IDs for all these. Um, and then there's some other columns. Um, the print method is, we just literally fixed this today. Uh, it has a little bit of a print method and you'll see what options is in a minute. Um, I'll show you what to do with this, but at this point we haven't done any estimation. We haven't done any fitting. This just defines all the things that we wanna do. Um, so let's see how we would then work with this. So we rely on resampling quite a bit. So I really feel that even with inferential models, resampling has a really, really important uh, place in our data analysis. Um, again, like just taking your data and like re-predicting it is never a great idea. Like even with a simple linear regression, you'll probably get similar, similar answers, but you don't really know. So resampling like the bootstrap or cross-validation is, is a pretty critical thing that we um, we encapsulate inside of almost everything for tidy models. This is a time series data set and maybe the bootstrap or, or cross validation wouldn't be the best idea. We have some specialized ways of doing uh, time series resampling. So there's this thing called rolling uh, forecast origin resampling. It basically takes an initial block of data. You fit your model on that. The next little bit of data is what you then do predictions on that you can estimate performance with. And then the next resample just shifts over by some increment. And you have like, you know, another training set that slightly overlaps with the one before it, but is later in time. And we have about 16 years of data in this data set. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 10 years. So the, the period here is the units of data. Um, since we know this is a, 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 a date, like a time series, we're gonna use 12 units, which is 12 months of data times 10. So we're gonna use 10 years as like the um, data that gets used to build the model. And then what we'll do is we'll use the next month after that 10 year um, span to predict and estimate our root mean squared or on. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna generate 67 different resamples, each is like shifted over by a month. And then when we resample all these models, especially when we do tuning and things like that, like let's say we tune over 20 values, 20 tuning parameter combinations of our neural network. That means we'll be doing, to figure out what the optimal value of that neural network should be, we'll be doing 20 times 67 model fits and using those to optimize performance for the neural network. Now, if you're doing this at home, like on my computer is fairly nice and I did this and it took about an hour to run. So if you wanna try this and do it in less time, what I would do is suggest bumping instead of 12, bump this up to, or I'm sorry, instead of 10 years, maybe use 12 or 13 years and that'll reduce the number of resamples and it'll run a lot faster for you. Um, but anyway, this is how I did the, the time series resampling. Um, this is via the R sample package. Um, and then, so what we'll do is we'll take that workflow set that we defined previously. We're gonna say evaluate it using these resamples. Um, now, 
seed and reproducibility is very important to us. So what you can do is you can have a seed that you give the workflow map function, and that will reset the seed every time you go to fit another model so that you can guarantee exactly what random numbers were used. You'll make sure the random numbers are gonna be the same across all the models. So that's not some uncontrolled piece. And this is just, it, the seed could be anything. It just makes it reproducible. Um, and you can, you can maybe intuit the name of this function is called workflow map. And it's basically like a per map where basically we're gonna do the same thing across all the rows of this data set. So it's like we're mapping across our eight different workflows here. Um, so we run workflow map. By default, what it'll do is for the models with tuning parameters, we use grid search to optimize them. Uh, for models with no tuning parameters, like that initial LM model, um, it'll just resample it to estimate performance. So you can use like Bayesian optimization, you can use racing, which I'll show in a little bit, um, anything you want to here by adjusting a different option, um, but by default, it'll do something pretty benign that works fairly well. Um, since we'll need to do grid search for a bunch of these models, you just you can give it a specific grid or you can just say, hey, pick 20 values that you think are good um, and it'll do that. And then another optional thing that we'll do is we'll tell it to optimize the RMC here. So when we look at which uh, workflow work best, we'll pick the one with the smallest RMC. So that gets estimated across all the, the grid values and all the resamples. So it's quite a lot of computations. It's like 20 times 67, times seven plus 67 model fits. So it's in the thousands. Um, now, one nice thing is we can do this all with parallel processing. So if we have like eight cores on a machine, we can split all those computations up across eight different cores. And we'll probably get like a, maybe like a five fold speed up by doing that, depending on your model and your data set and so on. So it, it is a lot of model fits, but at the same time, we've optimized a lot of the numeric components of this pretty well. So once I run this, um, there's like a, a verbose flag you can set that tells you the progress it's doing. But once it's done, when you print the results, this looks very similar to what we had before, but you might notice that this result column uh, is populated now with a bunch of objects. So resampling this RSMP means it was a resampled model fit, means it had no tuning parameters. Uh, the plus here means it executed without any problems. Like if it just crashed because you misspecified something or there was something weird in the data, you'd see an X here. So it wouldn't just stop execution if there's a problem. Um, and so this itself doesn't really tell you much, right? It's just telling you that you have all your results. We have tuning results across seven of the models and then just resampling results for the, the basic LM model. Um, what we've done is provided a really high level API. So if you just wanna rank the results, there's a function called, you know, rank results. Um, this option select best says, give me the results uh, using the best within each workflow. So if we fit like 20 different tuning parameters for the PLS uh, model with LM, just show me the best. Don't rank them by all of their models, like basically rank at the workflow level. And so this gives you a tibble back. I did uh, just a simple select here so it fits on the page. And you can see that there's about the same RMSC for like, let's say five of these models. Like numerically, the best one was using partial least squares with LM. Um, the neural net models didn't do so well. There's one that does fairly well here, um, but it's really not any different than the PLS model. Um, so this really quickly can tell you like, all right, where should I focus on my work on? Like in this data set, you might not know ahead of time, like, well, should I fit some big, like complicated nonlinear model? Should linear functions work? Like, do I need trees? You know, and, and, and this to me tells me that um, even the basic linear model did pretty well. So this is telling me that for the most part, the neural network isn't really necessary that most of the effects here that we're seeing are linear. And, you know, instead of writing eight different scripts to figure that out, you can do it in about you know, 10 lines of R code. There's also a nice auto plot method. If you just use auto plot here, it, it plots all the, the models that were fitted across all the workflows. 
So actually, I thought it was. Oh, uh, so these are the the mean and standard uh, error of the resampling results. So this dot here for the first workflow is average across all the resamples. So you can see there were like, I don't know, about a hundred and something models that were fit here. Some of them do really not great. Um, and then you can see some that are sort of in between, but then we have this plateau here with a, a few at the bottom. Um, and you can see that they are um, virtually the same here, if not really the same down here. So we have a lot of models we can choose from um, even though like one is always going to rank higher than the rest, these, you can see, especially from the standard errors, these things are pretty much the same. Um, they're colored by the type of model. Um, there are ways to produce more complicated plots from these results um, that are, and you can see that in the help file. Um, if we just want to know this, like at the workflow level, um, so like there's a lot of data in here from the same workflows. So if we want to do select best, it'll rank them by the best within a workflow. And then again, like the number one here was that PLS model. We also had a neural network that did about the same and so on. So you can see the best model within each workflow is actually not terrible. There's not a lot differentiating them here. So we can also pass in individual options. You know, so I mentioned that um, the minimum correlation here, it's, it's almost 0.9, I thought it was about 0.8. Um, so we might want to optimize not between zero and one, which is the default range for that tuning parameter, but we might want to set the um, threshold for that parameter to be, you know, instead of zero to one, you know, this range so that your, your tuning parameters um, do a good job covering the data. Um, and so one thing you could do is you, before you fit the model, you can just update the parameters for these. Um, like if you've used study models, this is a pretty standard way to update tuning parameter ranges. So that all works here, just the same as it does in tiny models. And then to add them back in the workflow, you just do this thing. We say, add this option for this workflow, I'm sorry, for this workflow and replace the, the default parameter ranges for these things. And then you can go on your way and fit those the way you like. So there's a lot of options in workflow sets in case you want to customize each individual workflow. There's a lot of APIs to do that. So that's nice. Uh, question, is there a potential for sort of meta overfitting issue with this approach? Yes, there is. That's, that's what I was like really worried about when I started to write the package. It's not terrible though. I mean, it's a real, but it's not necessarily, um, we've mitigated as much of that risk as we can. Uh, the one thing that mitigates that is we resample. So if you were really, really overfitting, the resampling results would be very poor. So we protect you from that standpoint by just not like re-predicting the, the training set. Um, so we've, we've enforced good methodology that way. You can use a validation set here if you want to. That also works pretty well if you have enough data. Um, another thing that we do to protect against overfitting is like what I was describing at the very beginning, that we've incorporated all the noise of our pre-processing um, parts inside of all that resampling. So we're resampling appropriately. So you can imagine like including some feature selection bits in here that would have a lot of potential to overfit. We make sure that we do those parts um, correctly so that if you were to overfit either in the resample or either in selecting features or tuning the model parameters, your performance as measured with a workflow set would be really uh, poor. So we do a pretty good job. I think, in fact, I think we do a really good job of like catching things that would um, overfit. I think the risk you run here is a small amount. I really do think it's a small amount of optimization bias. So you might look at this and say, oh, wow, I should expect this model to give me an RMSE that's about uh, 2.05, you know, and I know what the variation is on that. Well, this is the best um, the best results from within that workflow. So we're like picking the best and thinking that that's a good estimate of overall what it should be. Uh, and that includes some optimization bias here. The fact that we're not re-estimating performance once we found the optimum with different data. Um, it's a real problem, but I really think it's for the most part, not a practical issue. Um, optimization bias is real 
but the, the true RMC here might be like 2.1. I, I tend to, I, I try to measure this over and over again across a lot of different data sets. And what I found is, yes, by choosing the best results here from the tuning process and saying that is the, the estimate of performance, you do incur a real bias, but every time I've looked at this, it's always well, well within the noise of like resampling or estimation. So I think it's a real, but very, with, ex, with a few situations, a very minor um, amount of bias that you get. The, the problem is if you wanna get rid of that bias, you have to do like a nested resampling. And now you've just exponentially like increased the amount of computational time that things take. So I think when you do, when you do these methods to get rid of optimization bias, they work really well, but you're spending a lot of time in computing power to get rid of something that is like a 1% or a 5% problem. So that's my view on things. Okay. So there's a bunch of like auto plot methods. Like you might want to know for a particular model, like, um, you know, what tuning, why did it choose the tuning parameters that it did? So for example, what you can do is you could um, uh, uh, update the results here. You can look at the rankings and see that, uh, so this this is where I recomputed the neural net or the the filtering um, step to adjust the range to be between 0.8 and 0.1. And when I do that and recompute just those bits with the updated tuning parameter range, well, look, it turns out that doing that filtering uh, on a better range actually increased performance considerably. So you know the, these seem to be the best models previously, um, but now that I fixed the range of parameters the neural network is slightly, slightly edging out the, the LM model with, with just a, a little bit of feature selection. So this tells me that an appropriate range for feature selection did better than all the extraction methods. Now it's not much better, like you can see the noise here, but, um, but these now are ranked higher than the others. Then if I wanna see like, okay, for this model, you know, which tuning parameters seem to do the best. There's an auto plot method for that. You just tell it which workflow you want to look at. And then here are the 20 data points. You can see that it, it liked a lot of regularization. Uh, we might want to increase the regularization even more to get better results, maybe, maybe add more epochs, although that's not a huge effect and so on. So, um, so yeah, that's, um, that's uh, another visualization that you can do. So one other thing that we've included inside of workflow sets is it's one thing to be like, oh, well, this is the best model, you know, is, you know, now we're looking at a RMSE and these are units are thousands of riders. So, um, so RMSE in this is about, you know, 2020 riders, in, um, you know, when we're doing prediction and this one's about 2040 riders, right? So that's a, it's a pretty small difference. Uh, we don't know if it's statistically significant. Uh, it turns out there's just one type of Bayesian analysis called rope estimation, region of practical equivalence. And what you can do is you can say, like before you see the results, you can say like, well, how big of an effect would I want to see to call two models different? So the size here of a, of a value of point, uh, point 0.1 says that, you know, all things being equal, if I had a one model, um, that have an RMSE of like two, and I had another model that had an RMSE of like 2.1, I wouldn't consider that to be like a practical difference. And so we have this package called tidy posterior, which basically does um, uh, Bayesian estimation using the resampling to calculate the actual probability that these models are equivalent. So when we rank them by workflow here, um, the probability of practical equivalence based on the posterior distribution um, you know, our, our leading workflow is in the first position here, but the one that comes after that has slightly less performance has a, a probability of about, I think it's like 0.82, I think, um, of being practically equivalent to the best recipe. So what this will do is it tells you, you know, based on the effect size you specify um, a priori, you know, it tells you which one of these things are really equal to the others. Because this might be a, a model that does numerically better but this model, in fact, this is a neural network, but this LM model, you know, there's a pretty high probability that it's practically equivalent to the, to the neural network. 
And so there's a lot less parameters and it's probably a lot more robust. So, you know, this gives us some idea of like, um, of how, um, how real that effect is. Like there's like statistical differences and then there's like practical differences. And this rope estimation method helps you incorporate both of those together. Okay, how, about how much time do I have left? I, don't, I can't remember what time we started. Do I have like five or 10 minutes? Yeah, definitely. We have the room booked, I think until 8.30. So okay. yeah, feel free to go through anything else you wanted to. All right. I don't think I have much more after this. So, you know, this is where like the, the basic um, application of workflow sets comes in is like, we want to try a bunch of different techniques to solve a problem. We don't know which one's best. Uh, we don't want to have to write a bunch of different scripts to try a bunch of different things with a bunch of replication of code. So it allows you to bundle all together, fit it pretty efficiently, and then analyze the results like this, analyze them as a cohesive set of analyses that you can compare and contrast with. Um, another thing you can do is there's this approach called racing methods. And this is a way that you can really, really efficiently screen models. So imagine two models where one is just really awful and then one does you know, fairly well. Well, right now we're doing, is it like 67 resamples? So the, the problem with like um, grid search or one of the problems with grid search is you have to get all the results before you know if any of them just stink. Right, like if there's something you try, but you know pretty quickly it's not going to work. Well, you can't figure that out with grid set search, and because you have to do them all to get the results back. So what racing racing methods do is you give it like a burn in period. We say like I don't know, let's look at like the first five resamples, and you resample all the tuning parameters. Let's say for the first five resamples, and then you do some basically some data analysis to figure out. Like what's the probability any one of those tuning parameter methods is gonna be the best. So if you had like, let's say you had a neural network and you had like one hidden unit versus like 20 and, and 20 was doing well, but one had really bad performance. Like if I resampled five of them, I have like 62 more to look at. Well, you might not even wanna consider that, that single, uh, well, that'd be like clear regression. Like I should say two hidden units like that two hidden unit model because it has a very, very low probability based on the existing data of being optimal. And so there's a bunch of different ways you can do racing. Um, you can incorporate that into um, uh, this uh, workflow set approach. And there's a couple, there's a bunch of papers written about this. I wrote one like four or five years ago. Um, and in the Tiny Models book, um, we show some examples of this like between parallel processing and racing, like sometimes you can get like, I don't know, like a 30 fold speed up in your computations, depending on what you're doing. Like this wouldn't be great if you were doing like five fold, like cross validation. But if you have a lot of models and like, you know, like 10 fold cross validation, you can sometimes cut the amount of time you spend um, down considerably. Um, cause what it does is it only ends up resampling the models that seem like they're working really well. And, and as you get more resamples, the power it has of differentiating between these sub models, these tuning parameters becomes really increased. So at the end of racing, you have thrown out a bunch of models that you didn't even really need to consider. And you know that pretty early on. So you don't end up resampling those. Um, we have a, a pretty good chapter on that in tiny models. Um, the link is for the, the sections in there, but um, but just to give you a sense of what it's doing, where is that here? Uh, racing methods. Like if you were looking at like an ROC curve analysis as your performance metric, you know, the best ROC curve might be here. And then it does some statistical tests to figure out which ones are statistically different than the best. And then it would eliminate a bunch of parameters that just have no statistical probability of end up being the best. And so it just does that, that um, reanalysis as you go through resamples and you very quickly end up getting very quickly to the, like what seem to be the optimal results. And in, at least in the paper that I referenced here, um, you know, there were very rare cases where you end up getting a, an awful model. In fact, you never really got an awful model. You maybe like 50% of the time would get the one that you would have picked anyway from the full set of resamples. And then a lot of times 
um, there are some tuning parameters that have about the same performance. So it was almost, it was incredibly rare that we would get like a bad model from this racing approach. And so if you're fitting a bunch of different models and resampling them, racing here just is like an amplification of efficiency um, by including racing with your workflow sets. Um, I have a, uh, there's a chapter in Tiny Models where we look at um, the, exactly this application of using workflow sets with racing. So you, I think that's this chapter you can look at. Um, and to do that, if you want to use like the ANOVA racing method, the, your, all your other code would stay the same. You would just change the first argument to instead of grid or tune grid, you would use a different uh, tuning object um, from, uh, from one of our tiny models packages. So it's, it's pretty easy to use. Um, I'll talk about this and then skip the last application so we have time for questions. Um, you know, speaking of AutoML, one way to do that is to use this ensemble method called stacking. And what stacking does is you fit a bunch of different models using the same resamples. And then what you do is you build sort of a meta model on top of those resamples to basically have uh, an ensemble model that might be like, you know, 6% neural net, 3% nearest neighbors, like 20% linear model. So you can take all the models that you build along the way and then see if combining them in a stacked ensemble will do better prediction wise. Um, and so we, uh, I had an intern last year, Simon, Simon Couch, who actually won the uh, John Chambers Award for this particular package called Stacks. It was his summer intern um, project. And so basically you can take all the results you have from your uh, workflow set and just automatically add them to the stacked ensemble find the appropriate blend of models, and then finalize the model by fitting all the, the particular members that you need. So there's a lot more at stacks.tinymiles.org. We have a chapter, we haven't merged the PR yet, but there's a chapter of this in the book um, that should be merged, I'm hoping in a week or two. Um, again, it's a very powerful thing. Um, it most usually, it almost always gives you better performance than any individual model. The problems are that it might be like a 1% increase in performance. So it, it's usually very meager improvements. Um, so it's easy to do and it's fast. So, you know, the nice thing is it's not hard to do, but the thing is like, if you end up ensembling like 20 different models, now your ensemble, you have to have fits for those 20 different models. So sometimes it takes a while. Now I should say that, you know, when I was in drug discovery and we were looking at particular like I was in the part where we were screening compounds. We'd screen like millions of compounds and we would want to know like, you know, are they toxic or are they going to be like effective? Like, are they hitting the target that we want the drug to, to hit? And I'll, I'll be honest with you, if I'd increased like the, you know, the R, the R squared by like one or 2%, they might throw me a parade. Like that, if you're screening like millions of things, a 1% improvement doesn't sound like much, but it might be the difference between finding like a drug, a, a good molecule and not finding it. Um, so if you're in situations, like it's mostly used for like cattle competitions, but if you're in a situation where performance is super, super important for your model, um, if you're in that context, then stacking can be like a godsend for you. Um, H2O has a fantastic method for doing the same thing. Um, so, if you definitely like, like our, our performance, com computational for performance is pretty good in Tiny Models and in R, um, H2O is kind of like another level. It's super, super well optimized. Um, it, you don't have the same features that you have here. Like you can't use recipes and things like that. But at the same time, um, uh, H2O is great. So you should definitely try that if you're gonna do something like this. Not to diminish what Simon did, but it's really to me like, a fantastic implementation that definitely we're talking about. Um, I'll stop there. There's another application of like doing like variable assessment using workflow sets, but that's like another five slides and I should probably stop talking, um, but it's here and you can always like tweet at me if you have any questions about it. Um, you know, in summary, workflow sets could be really, really good when you need to try, when you're in the early phase of things, you just want, want to try a bunch of stuff to figure out like what the data needs. Does it need nonlinear non features? Does it need like, does it seem to work better with trees? Does it need interactions? Like if you don't know those things, uh, workflow sets could be really, really efficient to help figure it out. 
It also feeds nicely into stacking, so that's great. Um, if you want to use all the like the ranking features that we have in workflow sets, but you've already built a bunch of models outside like a workflow set, we actually have an as workflow set uh, function that will make an artificial workflow set out of them as if you'd started that way. Um, so that's a nice little thing. But you know, just one caveat, like I said earlier, I don't see this as the thing you're always going to use. Like it's it's a nice package that does a lot of interesting and good things, but it's not like 90% of the time you'll be using workflow sets. So just you know, don't don't opt over optimize is, would be my fear. Um, and then finally, you know, I have a great team. So Davis, Julie, and Hannah are fantastic. So I want to thank them. Allison Hill, you know, I think I've got the perfect set of CSS in my sharing and slides. And then Allison does something else. I'm like, Damn it. And she's always been great about giving us like templates for use for using uh, in presentations. So definitely want to thank her. And also a huge thanks for inviting me. Um, I, I said earlier that like like I was scheduling it and had to cancel, and I was kind of a kind of a pain in the ass to get uh, scheduled. So I want to thank the patients of the organizers uh, for getting me here uh, when they did. So that's it. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any final questions, feel free to either unmute yourself or throw that in the chat real quick. Just give that a minute. So I don't know if this is a ring endorsement or a condemnation. Uh, I had it here somewhere. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been watching Sliced, the the Twitch stream that's like data analysis, um, where it's like a it's like a two hour two hour like Kaggle competition where they get like four or five people like Julia and David Robinson and um, Jesse Mopak um, and a bunch of people have been on it and it's a lot of Python people. But they tweeted the other day. Somebody noticed that um, I just is like a little humble brag. We're not so humble brag that like a lot, what I didn't realize is of all the R people, like everybody's using tiny models, which I thought was really nice because like, you know, there's MLR, there's carrot, which was like my thing from a while back. But um, I just thought this was a nice little um, uh, um, call out to what we've been working on. So I look at this as a good like um, endorsement of the work that we've been doing. Endorsement of your work and also an endorsement of Sliced. Super fun, yeah. lots of memes uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it. Oh, so apparently David posted something too. Yeah, D David's great. Um, one thing David did is he contacted us because we like, you know, we've known him for a while. He wrote Broom and all that. And he actually had, we just were, I, like I did a, I've done like today and yesterday, I think I've done like six CRAN submissions across study models. And a few of those were for API, things that David suggested that were like, oh, how come I never thought of that? So much like the Tuddyverse, like when we find a better way of doing something, like we do it. Um, unlike the Tuddyverse, like Tuddy models tend to break less things. I shouldn't maybe say that because I'll probably jinx it like next week, I'll break something. But, um, you know, like David had a point that like, if you want to fit like an LM model, it should be like one line. And he was like, and that would be really easy if you just did this. We're like, oh my God, he's right. So we definitely want feedback. We, we very much react to feedback. So any, anything, if you use it, anything that you're like, oh, this is kind of a pain, definitely like we want to hear. We're not going to like give you a hard time for that, but we want to know if there's any other ways to improve what we're working on. So, yeah. I think that does lead to a great question of um, if we have comments or issues or do want to contribute to tidy models in general, what is the best way um, to do that? Is that through Git? Is that through Twitter? Um, so if you know what you want to do, 
Like if you're like, oh, it'd be good if we had a recipe step to do this, or if it's even something you know would be a good idea, but you're like, yeah, but I don't want to, I'm not a software engineer. Like, I don't know how to do that. Like probably the best thing would be to submit an issue through GitHub um, or tweet at us either like Julia and me and, and Davis and Hannah were all pretty active on Twitter. I'd say GitHub issue would probably be better because long form is better to explain what you want to do. Um, if you know what you want to do and you feel like you can do it, then put in a pull request. Um, we, um, you might want to talk to us about it first um, because uh, like we, we put a lot of developer documentation on the tidymodels.org site. So if you want to make like a new model, like parsnip model or something, like there's a lot of information on how to do that type of thing. But, you know, it, all, it doesn't hurt to contact us and say, hey, you know, like we were putting together like general generalized additive models and then somebody else was developing a whole package for that with tidy models. And to be honest with you, they didn't do a great job. Like they're like, we have a lot of things, you know, it's like the tidy burst. We have a lot of things that we definitely do. Like we like our argument names not to be very jargony. So like the penalty parameter for Glimnet, we don't call that Lambda because nobody who's, if you've not read the papers, that, what does Lambda mean, right? Like, I don't know. So, so, you know, we tend to use like real words like penalty. Um, and so, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to do something, maybe run it, not like you need our permission, but run it by us to say like, Hey, do you have any suggestions or things I should look out for? But, you know, even if it's like fixing typos or, you know, asking questions, especially if there's like a really good contribution would be like David did like saying like, Hey, I did all this stuff. Like, here's what I did. Did I make this more difficult than I should have been? Or is, is that the API is just a little bit like, eek. And we would, those are really, really important things to us. We definitely want to get API uh, feedback because, you know, like I said, we want to make our suck less for modeling and we don't want you to hate our R packages. So if you're frustrated by something or like, why does it do this? Like, don't have any worries about contacting us and asking us. Awesome, thank you.